Okay, okay. Good. Good morning. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about plugin vulnerabilities. Uh, recent months, I've noticed quite an uptick in the number of vulnerabilities that have been found in plugins, uh, not just obscure ones, but very popular ones. So I thought it would be interesting to talk through some of these, look at some of the code that they're doing, and see if we can learn something. And there will be some code examples. Uh, not too many, and they're kind of small, so don't be afraid. And it's kind of hard to talk about this kind of stuff without code examples. So, If you want to follow along the slides at home, here is the URL. This is going to be at the end of the presentation as well, so if you don't catch it now, don't be afraid. Uh, I am the head geek and CTO at Spectrum Technologies. We build custom plugins and do a lot of e-commerce work. And because we do e-commerce, I'm always very concerned about scalability and security. We want to make sure that our customers' sites stay up and they're earning their, their money. So it's very important for us, and it should be important to anyone who's working on a website. You don't want to get hacked. So we're going to go through three main areas today. We're going to look at a few different types of vulnerabilities, explore what they are and how they work. We're going to show you ways to fix and prevent those from happening in your code. And we're also going to dive into a little bit on what to do when you find a vulnerability in your own code as well as someone else's. So let's start with the definition. What is a vulnerability? Uh, it's really a combination of three things. You have to have something in the code that's susceptible to an attack. And then you need an attacker that has access and can run an attack on that code. And he's got to have the ability to run that. So those three things together are what can create a vulnerability. Remove any one of those and you're, you're more secure. So we're going to go through a few different types of vulnerabilities. <coughs> These are the main types, SQL injections, cross-site scripting, that kind of thing. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and interrupt. Uh, this is some technical stuff. So if things are confusing, let me know, and we'll try to get everything cleared up. Yes, Russ? I'm new to code. Can we talk about links first? Can we talk about links? You need to talk to William <laughs> Bay about links, <laughs> but, but thank you for playing. Okay, first and foremost is an SQL injection. This is my favorite. It is a hacker making it so that the SQL code that's running on your site is not going to be running the code that you're expecting it to run. They're adding something to it, they're creating a syntactical error in it, causing it not to run, or they're using it to add data into your database that you don't want in there. So an example of what this might look like is you've got a form on your page where you're asking for a username and a password. And then when you go to verify that information, you're handling that form, you build an SQL statement that takes that posted data and builds it into an SQL query. The example here is very bad. This is not what you want to do. Because if somebody uses the uh, login name of admin, and they put this weird looking string into the password field, that SQL would generate the SQL you see here on the screen. And since zero always equals zero, this is gonna allow you to log in to the site immediately as an admin. Fortunately, WordPress doesn't do this. They hash the password and they, they ver verify the hashes. So WordPress doesn't have this vulnerability, but this is typical and very easy to understand what is happening behind the scenes on an SQL injection. This is how bad it can get. You can get immediate admin access to the site. An example of this in a live plugin is, strangely enough, WooCommerce. On about, uh, I think it was March 11th, they found and fixed an uh, SQL injection vulnerability in their code. And it was in this function, the update tax rate location. They're passing in a tax rate ID, and a little bit later on, they're using that ID when they're building up that SQL statement. This is a private function, so it should be called in a very controlled manner, but it was actually being referenced from a public function without going through any additional uh, cleaning of this tax rate ID. So you could pass in invalid data into this and have that generated into your SQL statement and cause a problem. 
real simple fix to get this to be more secure. You add this line in green and you ensure that that value is a positive integer instead of, I don't know, some random string. Now you're working with data that you know what it is. And you can add that safely to your SQL statement and go on your way. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? It's just a matter of making sure that you're working with the data you're expecting. Next type of vulnerability is called a cross-site scripting. And this is kind of fun, uh, a little bit confusing. It's uh, adding JavaScript to a, a page that is going to make that page do something that you're not expecting. An example of this is another form where you're asking for some profile information. So let's say you're asking for somebody's Twitter handle. Pretty simple, right? And then later on when you're viewing th that profile, the, the code used to generate that uh, would just echo out that Twitter name, right? Because they entered their Twitter name. So that, that's, that's simple, right? Easy. No problem, right? Well, but what if they do this? Instead of putting in a Twitter name, they put in a little JavaScript tag and they run this weird looking JavaScript statement here. What is that going to do? So when you output that onto your page, what it's doing is it's creating an image and then adding all of the login user's cookies to that URL and passing that to their hacker's website. Some of the cookie information that's coming with that is your login session. So if an admin goes and views this profile page, they're going to be sending their current login cookie information to the hacker. And the hacker can copy that into their own cookie session, and now they're logged in as an admin on the site. So this can be very dangerous. Any questions? Is everything perfectly clear? So an example of this is the 4.2.1 release in WordPress itself. Uh, they found that there was an area in dealing with the comment titles that would allow that unfiltered information to be output onto a page. And so they recognized this and they added these areas that you see in green, the, the highlighted areas, uh, to go through and verify that this information is just a title. It's not going to have any additional scripting added to it to allow any kind of an attack on that code. Any questions? Okay. Another example is in the Give plugin. Uh, about the same time as the 4.2.1 release, there was a widespread cross-site scripting vulnerability. You guys probably heard about it. Uh, there were uh, a couple dozen plugins that were found to have this problem. And it was kind of an unprecedented event. Uh, the plugin authors kind of all get together and they helped alert each other and they worked together to have a coordinated release of updates for all these plugins. And we're not talking about ex obscure plugins, we're talking about the ones that we all use. WordPress SEO, EDD, uh, WooCommerce. Give with it was another one of these plugins uh, written by Devin Walker of WordPress. And Essentially, the fix for this is adding this highlighted area in green. Uh, the concern was with the add query arg uh, function. Uh, that could be used to create some cross-site vulnerabilities. And escaping that URL before it's being output onto the page is all you need to do to fix it. But there was some sample code that everybody was using, and that had the vulnerability in it. So the coordinated effort was to get everybody together to clean up that code and get that released all those plugins updated before the announcement of the update was made. Uh, if you want to read up a little bit more on that event and uh, the, the process that Give went through, or the WordPress guys went through, you can read Matt Cromwell's uh, blog post on it with the, uh, the link here, the WordPress site. And there's also a, a security uh, blog post about that, the entire event and uh, naming a bunch of the plugins and more, more and more detail on that vulnerability. Yes, sir. Isn't there a service you can use to, t to test your site for vulnerabilities like this where it can automatically try and log in and, and do all kinds of stuff? Yeah, so, so the question is whether or not there's a service that will do some of this vulnerability checking for you. 
And yes, there are. Uh, there's a well-known uh, antivirus company, <laughs> name's escaping me right now because I didn't really plan on talking about this during the, the presentation, but there are several companies that will do uh, checks on a site running several different types of uh, vulner vulnerabilities and attacks on a site and give you a report. Uh, McAfee, I think, was the name of that. Uh, they have a service where they'll do that and they'll run all these tests on the site and give you a report of what are potential areas of concern and how secure the site is just from the outside looking in. And that's what a hacker's view is going to be. They're not, they don't have access to your code necessarily. Uh, but they run these scripts and they just run through these scripts and try all these different attacks on a site to see if one of them is going to stick. Mika, you had a question. Uh, but they do have access to your source code because most of the plugins are located in an open repository. So if they know you are running a plugin that is vulnerable, Yes, that's very true. Uh, she mentions that they do have access to most of your code because it's all in the WordPress repository. Uh, that's true of all the GPL plugins that are in there. Uh, but the McAfee guys will also run uh, th their tests against non-WordPress sites. So in that case, they don't always have the access to the code. And you can have custom code on a site too that nobody else ever sees. Uh, but yeah, most of these guys that are running attacks, it's not really a guy at a keyboard trying to, to type in your URL and see what they can do. They run these automated scripts and look at thousands and thousands of sites trying to hack those sites every day. So the next type of vulnerability is called a cross-site request forgery. It's uh, big and complicated, but it effectively means that they're trying to get your browser to submit a request to the server under your login session so that it might be accepted as, as a true request. Uh, they're just doing something kind of behind the scenes without your knowledge that can affect your experience on that site. So what that looks like is something like this. Let's say you have an e-commerce site and you're allowing your customers to write reviews. And you've got this, this form field and, and people can type in a couple paragraphs of what they thought about your product. And then later on you output that information. Doesn't look too bad, right? Well, it can get kind of bad. Because what if they do this? So what this is doing is it's making another request to your site and running the request adds products to your shopping cart. So that's, that's going to add to your cart when you're using the, the site and your cart when you're using the site, but you don't know this. So when you go to add something to your cart, you add, uh, I don't know, a coffee cup and you find out that they've added 100 t-shirts to your shopping cart at the same time. Um, that's not going to give a customer a really comfortable feeling about using your site. So that's bad. Not a good user experience. What if they're really cool t-shirts? Well, if they're really cool t-shirts, it's less of a sting. But if you only want the coffee cup, <laughs> not, not so good. Russ, Russ is going to be our heckler for the day. This is good. I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. What if they did something like adding a product to your cart that's a, a product that's on the site with, with a price of free? Uh, so the question is, what if they add something to the cart that was free? Yeah, it's a product on site that the site the merchant is selling. Right. Let's say fifty dollars, and then a hacker has added this to where everybody's cart gets this product for free. Right. So what what if they're adding something to the cart that is for free? So you don't notice a, a, a change in the price but you're still getting the product that the, the seller really wants to sell for money, not, not just give it away. Uh, most of the shopping carts, you can't really manipulate the price from the outside. You tell it, here's this product ID, add that ID to my shopping cart. But they can't also say what price. They can't, well, unless your shopping cart system has some other vulnerabilities in it. But for the <laughs> most part, you're adding something to the cart and it knows what the price is, so it's gonna do the tallying and the taxes and everything for you. Yeah, Jared? You can do it with coupon codes a lot. Yes, you can do it with coupon codes. Yeah, but there has to be a valid coupon code that you, as the customer checking out, have access to and can use. So if it's like a one-time use coupon, that wouldn't work because it's already been used by somebody else or maybe by you previously. Uh, but yes, all these types of things can happen. You can add products. You can, anything you can do as a user can be built into a vulnerability like this if it exists on the card. Whatever experience you can do, interactions that you can do, uh, this will be able to do the same things. Next type of, vul of vulnerability is called a privilege escalation. 
And think of this as uh, you're logged in as a subscriber on a site, and then all of a sudden now you're an admin. You can add plugins, you can delete plugins, you can create users. Uh, that's a privilege escalation. Question. Yes, sir. Uh, was there a fix for the, uh, the last one? The, uh... the cross site request forgery? Yes. Uh, it's essentially the same kind of fix. The, the question is, w is there a fix for this type of forgery? And it's the same as the previous one. Uh, it, it's properly escaping the data that's going out to the site, not allowing someone to add a JavaScript uh, request to, to add more products to your card or a coupon or something like that. So privilege escalation. So this happened a few months ago, I think it was the middle of March, in the WP All Import plugin. Uh, what he did here with the fixes is he added code into the AJAX handlers so that it checks to make sure that you're logged in and that that logged in user has the correct capabilities to run that request. And without this, you could use some AJAX queries to perform actions on the site that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to do because it's expecting you to be logged in as an admin. Well, here now you're making sure that the user's logged in as an admin. And only that admin would have access to do this. Does that make sense? So we've seen the ugly side. What do we do now? How do we protect our code and make sure that this doesn't happen to our stuff and our customers have 100 t-shirts added to their shopping cart? So first and foremost, trust no one. If you have data that's coming into your site from users or APIs, it doesn't matter if it's an admin user or a, a customer, make sure that that data is what you're expecting it to be. Validate everything. And by that I mean everything. Russ, that, that was for you. Is that with the capital E or lowercase e? All capitals, okay. <laughs> red letters, 24 point, this is, if you don't do anything else, just do this. Verify that the information coming in is the information you're expecting it to be, and they're not slipping something in, okay? A couple of tools you can use to do this kind of thing. Uh, the int val and abs int functions are really handy for integer input. They make sure that that is an integer. That's what the, the WooCommerce guys did to fix that SQL injection that you saw. Simple as that, one little line of code, but it makes a difference. If you have uh, email information coming in, check and make sure it's an email address. Uh, you can remove script tags and uh, link references in a block of HTML using the WPKSES functions. So that's a really good way to clean uh, data that, that you want to have a limited subset of HTML commands. You know, underscores and bolds are okay, but scripts, not so much. And you also want to verify the range of data uh, if you have a, a form field and you're asking for a month, just check and make sure that that is a value between 1 and 12. That's what you're expecting it to be. So write a little piece of code that makes sure that that's a number between 1 and 12, because that could cause problems later. Number two, sanitize everything. There are a whole bunch of tools in WordPress that will allow you to sanitize the information, make sure that the email is in the correct format, uh, sanitize file names, HTML content, post fields. Uh, bottom of this page has a link to the, the Codex page on, on the WordPress site that tells you all about these validation and uh, sanitizing functions, how to use them. There's, uh, there's more than just what I have listed here. It looks like a lot, but uh, there's a lot of different types of data that you can use. So there's a lot of different tools that you have to work with that. Number three is escape everything. This is important on the cross-site scripting and the request forgery types of vulnerabilities. So th this, is, this is what you were asking about. Um, make sure that you're escaping the information so that the, if someone does input uh, some HTML code, that gets output and is appearing as HTML code. It isn't real HTML code. So the escape attribute is used when you're building up the attributes on a, uh, an HTML element. You can use that to make sure that those things are going to be correct syntax and, and quotes and things are escaped so that you have nice, well-formed HTML. And the escape HTML is used when we're working with uh, larger blocks 
uh, of HTML code for like a, a comment post. That, that you can have some types of HTML in there, but not others. And the escape JavaScript is used when you're outputting uh, JavaScript code. It, it understands quoting and, and, and braces and, and things like that uh, for JavaScript code. So you're sure that that's going to be well-formed JavaScript code and not causing errors when your page is loading. And then you've got different tools for working with text areas and URLs. Uh, the URL was used for the ad query arg issue with that uh, widespread vulnerability that I talked about before. So any questions on this? You're going to sanitize everything? Sorry? Do you, do you yes. escape or sanitize first? Uh, I usually sanitize first so that I know that that email is an email address. And then if I need to escape it when I'm outputting it, I escape it when I'm outputting it. Uh, you always want to sanitize before you put it into the database. You want to make sure that that data is going to be what you're expecting it to be. Then you also need to escape the SQL. This is for your SQL injection vulnerabilities. Uh, there are a couple of tools built in for that. Uh, you don't want to ever just take that raw post data, like in the first example on the uh, admin login page. You don't want to take that and add that to your SQL statement and build up an SQL statement that way. You always want to escape that stuff because that is an area that can either cause your site to not function or get that bad data into your database and then it's there and it's really hard to find. Uh, you can also use the prepare method. That's really nice because you can tell it not only the data, but the type of data that you're expecting that to be. So strings are going to be encoded as strings, and numbers are always going to be encoded as numbers. It's really useful for that. And it ensures that that SQL is going to be very well formed. Um, but rather than writing your own insert and update SQL queries, uh, you can use the WPDB insert function and the update function to do those operations. So those are handy because you, you end up actually writing a little bit less code. You just pass it an array of data and tell it the database table name to insert it into, and it goes and does it in a very safe way so that you're not going to have any problems with SQL injections. And when you're working with uh, building up like clauses for your SQL queries, there's an escape like, which properly encodes the, uh, the percent signs and, as well as quotes and other things uh, for use in your like uh, reference qu uh, queries. Any questions right, right now? Okay. Uh, next one is validate the user and the session. So this is what they did for the WPL import. He added checks to make sure that the user was logged in and that the user had the correct capabilities to perform the operation that they're performing. This is especially important when working with the AJAX callbacks. Uh, most of the time when you're working on a page in the admin, the admin interface itself is checking credentials and it's checking your permissions and it's doing that for you. But the AJAX is a little bit different. Uh, it, it's almost like it's running an admin privilege by default. You can do anything. So you want to make sure that the user has the correct rights to do what you're letting them do within that AJAX callback. And another part of this is using what are called nonces. Nonce is a, a funny sounding word that's actually an acronym. It means a number used once. And you can think of it as a token or like a, a one-time use coupon. Uh, you generate this nonce and it's just a, a number that's put onto your form. And then later you can check to see if that nonce matches what it should be. So that way when one user is creating this form and using the form, they get their nonce and then another user gets a different nonce. You can make sure that, that way that the form submission is a correct, accurate form submission. And nonces also have a timeout. I think the default is 30 minutes. So if you're sitting on that form page for 30 minutes and then you submit the form and it says that's not a valid form, that's why. Your nonce expired. So that helps what are called uh, repeat attacks. You can grab that form and submit that form multiple times. Well, with nonces, you're bringing down that window of submitting that multiple times to only a half hour period. So there's a codex page here uh, talking about nonces and a bunch of functions that are used to create and compare those nonces. Make sure you use that on all of your forms when you're processing data. It makes those forms much more secure. So to sum up, if you do nothing else, validate everything for type, 
length, range, just make sure that it's the data you're expecting it to be. Escape everything on output so you don't get those cross-site vulnerabilities. And I would recommend not writing your own escaping and validation functions. WordPress has a bunch of these that are built in and they're very useful. But they also have a, uh, a number of hooks in them so that other plugins can use to extend their capabilities. And if you're writing your own and you don't put in those same hooks, your validation functions aren't going to have that same uh, feel with other plugins that are expecting those to be in place. So just use the tools that are provided instead of trying to invent your own. Also, these are written by guys that are smarter than I am, smarter than, than a lot of others. Uh, they're the Web WordPress core team. So they know security really well, and they're going to build these functions so that they're secure, and they're updated all the time whenever new vulnerabilities are found. <coughs> and then lastly, again, I can't stress it enough, don't ever trust user input. And this actually does include information coming from other sites, other APIs. If, you, if their site is hacked, and their data coming out is now corrupted, that corrupted data can get into your site. So it doesn't take much to do, just do a check on that and make sure that the data is what you're expecting. So you've updated your code. Now what do you do? First and foremost, update your code in the repository, update your plugin, your theme, and make sure that that's done before you start announcing to the world that you've just done a security update. <laughs> you don't want to announce a security vulnerability without the patch. People need access to that so that they can update their site. And if you, if you announce first and then update, you, you're increasing this window where hackers who also read these things they can find that information and run the attacks on, on your site before your customers or users have had a chance to update their site. If it's a really serious vulnerability, you can talk to the WordPress team, right? Explain to them the nature of it. In some rare cases, they have worked with uh, plugin vendors and actually pushed forced, re uh, forced updates to plugins so that people are updated before the announcement of the vulnerability goes out. And that's really important on very, very large, popular plugins. I think they did this recently with a WordPress SEO plugin. It's important to get that code fix in place before the announcement is made. For less serious vulnerabilities, uh, go through the support forums, do your blog posts, just get the word out, make sure people know about the uh, vulnerability and the nature of it. You don't want to hide it and say, we did an update, but I'm not going to tell you there's a security patch. You want people to know that there's a security patch. Uh, the WPL import guys did a really good job of that last March when they had theirs. They said, hey, everybody, update now, and this is why. It was really important. So you don't want to hide it. Be honest. Tell your customers. If you find a vulnerability in somebody else's code, there's this thing that's been going around called responsible disclosure and the now more politically correct coordinated exposure. Uh, what that means is d going through that review process, letting that company know, that plugin vendor know that there's this problem in his code before you go tell all your friends and write blog posts about this problem in his code. Again, you want the patch available before the announcement is available. You might have bragging rights, but you're, again, increasing that window where people can make uh, attacks on a site before it's been updated. Every vendor is different. So talk to the vendor, find out what their process is, find out how best to work with them. Maybe you need to explain to them the code, the changes that need to be made. Uh, maybe they know. But either way, talk to them about their vulnerability. And some vendors actually pay money uh, when the, the you find a vulnerability. Uh, I know uh, GitHub does, WordPress does. They'll pay you money. and and reward you for letting them know about a vulnerability and going through their process and working with them. Mika, you had a question? Uh, if you can't get a hold of the vendor, you can email plugins at wordpress.org and we can help you get in touch. Great point. She reminds us, if you can't get a hold of the vendor yourself, go through plugins at wordpress.org and they will use their weight and might of WordPress to help get the word out and get co in contact with that plugin vendor so that their code can get updated. They want a secure site as much as anybody, probably more than anybody. 
So an example of a bounty program is what GitHub does. This is what's on their page talking about their bounty program. They want you to find problems in their site and tell them about it, but not the whole world. They'll pay you to tell them about it, but not the whole world. So work with them, uh, work with uh, WordPress. They've paid out money just as recently as last week and, and the week before last for people that have found vulnerabilities, work with them, and gotten a patch in uh, the, their way, the responsible way, working with that vendor. So that's uh, pretty close to the end. Uh, we recently added a plugin to the re repository. Uh, it's a tool that we use to help clean up databases and uh, do an optimization on those database tables. If you're interested in looking at the code or even participating and helping us build out this plugin a little bit more, um, you can take a look at it here. And for some additional information, and the, the, the URL for these slides, again, is right there. Uh, some additional reading here. And before I go into the questions, I just want to give a big thanks to the plugins that you saw in this presentation. Uh, Louis Reingold from WPL Import and uh, Devin Walker of Word Impress, authors of Give and Patrick Rowland from the WooCommerce team. Uh, I contacted all these guys and asked them if I can use them, volunteer them to be guinea pigs in this presentation, and they all said, yeah, sure, that'd be great. So thank you to those guys for, uh, for letting me talk about their code and showing the, these in the presentation. So at this point, any additional questions? Yes, in the back. Yeah, a uh, good question. Um, great rundown how to prevent exposure to these things. Um, if you sense that something is wrong, how, how do you go about doing an analysis very quickly across the site to try to figure out where the problems are? Okay, if you sense that something is going wrong or could go wrong, how do you do an analysis on the site? Um, that's kind of a, a, a long open-ended question. What I do when I start looking at a piece of code for a security review is I look for WPDB, that class uh, that, that does all your database work, and I'll scan through all the code that uses WPDB, every single line that uses it, and just look at how that's being used, what SQL is being run through that, are they using prepares, are they escaping the information. That's where most of your SQL injection stuff happens. Uh, the cross-site scripting problems are a little bit harder to deal with, but then you're looking for sanitizing. Uh, your form processing is where you look in there. So when you're working with like uh, the settings API, the, the callback that's used to process that form data, you want to make sure that they're using the sanitizing functions in there and, uh, and just checking the ranges of values and things like that. So that's where you can kind of reduce, instead of looking at 30,000 lines of code, you can look at 3,000 lines of code. Just look for those areas and that can help. Any other questions? Or was this all just perfectly clear? Andy's nodding his head, so that's good. I, I, I helped Andy. Russ, a last parting heckle? No? Let's say you have a plugin that's making all whole database queries, stuff like that. Is there a way that you can wrap each one of those in one kind of filter to filter each one as it goes? If you have a plugin that's got a lot of database activity going on, can you so, yeah, instead of like filter escape, that into one? Again, that, that would be another that would be another rather long open-ended conversation. It depends on how that plugin is built. Um, I tend to run my code through filters like that, uh, especially for things like AJAX queries. So I have one place to do all the, the checking and the, the capability verification on those. You can do a similar thing in uh, database access. First off, use the WPDB functions instead of writing your own SQL queries. So then you don't have to check those. That's running through the, the WPDB class methods and you don't have to do as much work that way. They're, you can trust those to be uh, pretty secure. Uh, but you can write your code in such a way that you have a, a central location that does most of that heavy duty database stuff. Then at least you're localizing stuff into a single place like the WPDB class and you reduce uh, the, the breadth of the code that you have to look through and that has the potential for those types of problems. Does that help? <coughs>
Any other questions? I think we need to wrap up here pretty soon. We have two minutes. Anything else? I can end early. One more here. Yeah. If I'm not writing my own themes or codes or programs, making my own audience, you know, I'm just a developer that's using the typical tools that are out there. Mm -hmm. Besides making sure that I keep everything updated, I mean, like for example, um, a lot of websites just use Contact Form Seven. Mm -hmm. Can I just trust that their their forms are locked down, or are there other plugins to make it more secure? Or should I not use them? Okay, let me see if I get this right. Uh, if you're not writing your, your own plugins, you're just using things in the repo, uh, things off the shelf, if you will, uh, is there a way to make sure that those plugins are doing things well? Um, hmm, another long, open-ended conversation. <laughs> um, for, for the, there, there is a test. When the, when the plugins are being submitted to the repository and updates are being made, Mika over there uh, is one of the people, yeah, don't hide, uh, she's one of the people that reviews that code. Uh, she and the, the other guys, Pippin and, and Mark Jaquith is also on, on that Otto. team. Otto, Otto. These guys look through line, every line of code that are submitted for each of these plugins. And they look for these vulnerabilities, among other things. Uh, there's a number of uh, requirements in order to get in the repo. But one of them is making sure that the plugins are written so that they are secure and they don't have a lot of these problems. So. For the most part, you can trust what's in there. The thing is, they only know what they know. The vulnerability that's in WordPress that nobody has found yet, they don't know about that one. <laughs> so it's kind of a trick question. Uh, for the most part, yeah, you can, you can be fairly secure that the plugins that are in the repo are good. Um, the problem is when you have in the repo and then some custom code, you don't know what the interaction of all of that can be. And so that's where you might run into problems. But uh, there are several companies uh, that, that will do reviews of code to help track down what these vulnerabilities can be and make sure that the, it's uh, secure code. Does that help? Okay, I think that's it. So thank you very much. <laughs>